All right, thank you for clicking on this video, what to do five years before retirement. So we're going to try to look at what we need to accomplish overall with five years to go so that we're set up well at retirement. And we're kind of in the home stretch. Five years is going to go by incredibly fast. So what's the first thing to do? Well, first thing, what I want you to do is do everything I told you to do 10 years before retirement. There's another video on that. So you need to go see the cleverly worded video, what to do 10 years before retirement, and repeat all of that. So in addition to those items, which we're going to relook at, we have a few more. We had talked about this a little bit before. Are you going to stay in your home? But now we're so close to retirement, we really need to look at this issue. So let's say you want to move to a new area. Like we talked about before, if it's back home to Alabama, back home to Texas, back home to family, that's very different than we love Sedona, we want to retire in Sedona, and we don't know anyone in Sedona. Okay, Big, big difference. So if you think you're going to sell your house and move, one of the first things you should do is get the local newspaper. All right, Whether you get it online and you should read the Sunday paper, you know, how much crime is going on? Where are the good areas? Where are the bad areas? Start taking more vacations to that area. And just don't stay in the hotels with Home Finder and uh, a lot of local sites where you can get into a residence and stay for a week to get the feel of what it would actually be like to live there. Give strong consideration to renting for a few years in the area that you want to live. So after retirement, you move out of your house, rent your house, keep your house. Move to the new area and rent there. If then a couple of years comes by, you love that area and you still want that house, then you can sell your house and buy a house in the new area. But if you decide that, hey, I miss my family, I miss my friends, I miss my church, you know, we're now bored with Sedona, I don't need to golf that much, or whatever it is, now coming home, you've saved a lot of money. Because if you are going to sell a house in one spot, buy somewhere else, that's going to be probably sixty to $80,000 in transaction costs. Then if you decide you hate where you live and you go to move back, that's another sixty, eighty thousand dollars $80,000. So you're probably not going to be able to even buy the same house back again. So give very strong consideration to renting. The other thing you have to be careful of, a lot of people say, well, I'm going to move wherever my kids are. And so they retire, they sell their house, they move to Indiana, they move to Portland or wherever, they get up there for a couple years, they get established, and lo and behold, one of their children gets a promotion, and now they're off to Texas. So are they going to then uproot and move again? Got to ask yourself uh, those. The other thing that you need to ask yourself is, okay, we like this area. We love our house. Can we do what's called age in place? Do we have a single story house so that we're not going up and down stairs in our 80s? Do, do we have a lot of stairs in the front yard? Is our house split level? Can we open up our door jams farther so if someone's in a wheelchair, we can get through? A lot of people that love their house, love their community, um, in a single-story house, want to stay there. Instead of spending the $60,000, $70,000 in transaction fees, you can put $60,000, $70,000 into remodeling and get an awful lot done. You can customize it to the bathroom and tub that you want. You can widen out openings. You can um, make a lot of things a lot more accessible while you age. And so that's an important consideration. I want you to take a look at all of your expenses now, especially the bigger ones. First thing you need to do, if you haven't cut off your kids at this point, you need to cut your kids off. Their poor choices or inability to get on their feet is not your financial burden. The only caveat I would say to this would be if you have a child who is physically 
or mentally disabled i mean they truly cannot help themselves they're never going to be able to help themselves and if this is true then you've got a lot of planning to do for them because who's going to take care of them after you die so if they're truly disabled and never going to be independent then you need to make plans for them you need to set boundaries for parents if they need to be supported how much are you willing to do if you have a parent that's a bit destructive you do not automatically invite them into your house to stay your number one obligations to your spouse and if your mother is horrible to your wife or horrible to your husband then they should not be welcome in the house you do not destroy your relationship and family over obligations to someone who cannot behave well now these are incredibly hard things to do and incredibly complex and at this point an awful lot of times even ten years out I suggest that individuals go to a counselor and meet with a counselor and discuss these problems and it's not to fix the kids it's not to fix the parents it's how can I emotionally get my hands around the fact I've done everything I can and they're still sucking money so I'm gonna cut them off and a lot of parents feel tremendous guilt in that situation and so they need the counseling so that they can cut them off and move on some of the other big expenses that we see at this point a lot of times people have acquired boats RVs hot rods other assets that suck up a lot of money if you are not using them if the boat's been sitting there and hasn't gone out in nine months if the hot rod just kind of sits and rarely gets driven you've only gone out on your RV three times in the last two years sell this asset a lot of times these assets aren't being used is for two reasons one we had a lot of fun boating or RVing and we did it all the time and we took our kids and we had great family time but now the kids are grown and the kids are gone and now it's my wife and I and well you know without the rest of the family we're really not that much into RVing but you know maybe we'll get back into it when we retire more likely than not you won't and so these assets require insurance licensing maintenance sell that asset put the money aside in a bank account you can even add the money you would spend on licensing maintenance storage parking etc cetera, etc cetera. set that aside and when you retire if you decide hey, I want to buy a boat then you've got the money there and then some you don't have a dilapidated boat that hasn't seen the water in four years that's going to take a ton of money to recondition to even get it seaworthy so we want to sell those assets that we're not using bank the money also we want you to enjoy your retirement retirement should be a lot of fun so five years out we need to do more on developing our hobbies we need to uh, spend more time with them um, try different hobbies some people get into things and they don't like it start making volunteer connections we talked about this a little bit you know go to some habitat for humanity meetings do something once every three months so that when you retire maybe you can do something once a week who knows but kind of get experience once again so many people buy RVs that once again at five years you need to start taking RV vacations if you think you're gonna drop two three four hundred thousand dollars on an RV when you retire for me personally I did a lot of RV and rented a lot of trailers and had a blast with my family when they were three four five seven nine twelve years old we had a lot of fun never owned one always rented and I never had to worry about maintenance storage also during the winter we rented a big RV because typically it would rain and cold and we spend more time inside the RV um, during the summer we rented one a lot smaller to force the kids out into uh, the wilderness and out into enjoying the outdoors so the great thing about just renting an RV is you can try totally different styles different sizes um, what's it like to drive a 26-foot RV a 32-foot RV 
a 24 foot RV. A lot of people get these big RVs and they drive them and then they hate it. And then they have to turn around and sell it and buy something smaller because you're just completely uncomfortable driving it. So this is an expensive asset that you need to uh, look into. The other thing is, are you going to work part-time in retirement? So you need to ask yourself a couple of questions. One, do you hate your job and the people you work with? Obviously, if you do, that's an easy answer. You're gone, you're done, never to look back again. And there's a lot of people like that. But there's even more people that they like their job. They don't necessarily love their job. They wouldn't do it for free. But they like their job. They like the people. They like the you know birthday cakes that come once a month and seeing people and talking about their kids and playing fantasy football leagues and you know going out to lunch, all that type of stuff. So if you love the people that you work with, you might want to consider staying part-time. It's hard to take a big piece of your life five days a week, eight, nine hours a day, and then just come to an abrupt end and think you're going to fill all that time after you lose all your professional connections, friends, and a lot of people tend to lose some purpose in life when they do that. So we want to do this as a transition. So I want you to think, will you be ready to fully retire? A lot of people that's no, some it's yes. Maybe what you want to start trying to set the plans for is to work two or three days a week. If you work two or three days a week, now you've got four or five days a week off instead of only having two. Much different dynamic. To accomplish that, you know, how will you do that? How will you convince your boss to do that? So you want to start formulating some ideas at this point. Do you want a smaller territory? Do you want to work seasonally? Maybe you want to get out of your job, but you still want something to do and you want to have a quote-unquote fun job. One of the quote-unquote fun jobs that a lot of guys do um, who love to golf is to work at a golf course. And they get paid either nothing or minimum wage. And with that, they get to golf once or twice a week for free. And they get into the men's club for free. And, and quite frankly, they say, it gives me something to do two days a week. So they go drive around as a course marshal or something like that. Um, maybe you think it'd be fun to work in a flower shop and you want to try designing. Yeah, you're going to make maybe minimum wage or a buck over minimum, but if it's kind of fun and something to try and you're getting paid and maybe you're going to do it two or three days a week, that you might find very fulfilling. Not only that, but if you're going to get, say, ten, fifteen, twenty thousand dollars $20,000 of part-time income, that certainly is going to go a long way to fund an awful lot of the other fun stuff that you want to do those first three, four, five years. We also need to go back and project expenses again. Certainly, we're closer to retiring. Hopefully, you're getting a better handle on what retirement is going to look like so we can get closer to expenses. Some of the expenses that are going to go down are clothing and eating out. Now, eating out is going to go down, typically not because you eat out any less, but you just have time to go through all the coupons, find all the buy one, get one freeze. You know, who's got better uh, deals going this week? Who's running this special? And so we tend to find retired people eat out just as much, if not more, than people who aren't retired, but they actually spend less on eating out because they have the time to find the coupons and the time to go through those things. Some of the expenses that are going to go up, odds are healthcare is going to go up, especially if you, at your current job, have very good healthcare coverage, vision, dental. When you retire and you go on Medicare, the average Medicare senior citizen has three to five thousand dollars a year out of pocket. So you've got to budget that. If you've got really, really good health care and your maximum out of pocket is, say, $1,000, you have to know, good chance, some years, you're going to be kicking another $4,000 into health care. It's about 300 bucks a month, 350 That's a lot of money. Certainly, travel and enter entertainment expense is going to go up. You've just got more time. The first year that I came to teaching. I was about 15 years in industry and I started teaching full time. And I did some consulting for a couple years and then I let that go. 
And so I came to my first summer of not working. And I was so looking forward to it. I was going to sleep in, go to matinees, do a number of other things. And I had a blast. And it took me about six weeks to run through my entire summer budget. I was going to the movies all the time. And then, like nothing to do, we hopped in the car and went down to the beach and ate down at the beach. And then we decided to go further to a different beach. And next thing you know, we're spending all this money because we have all this time. Um, Got to be very careful on that. And once again, uh, go back to the video on projecting expenses if you want to know how to best project your expenses. On the financial side, now we need to start shifting some of our money into fixed income instruments. What I want you to think of in your uh, portfolio of retirement funds is you have like two pots of money. One pot is growth money. Even at the day you retire, you still need growth money. You're going to be retired for 15, 20, 25 years. That money has to grow. A lot of the money you're not going to use. You've also got fixed income money. This is the money you're going to be spending in the next five, seven years. You need that set aside in much, much safer instruments. When we are projecting how much money we need, how much we should have in stocks, how much we should have in bonds, I want you to consider this. Social Security is like having a bond. It's going to generate you fixed income every single month. Your pension is like a bond. It's going to generate fixed income every single month. So if you're looking only at the money you have in stocks and that portfolio and thinking you have to diversify in bonds, but you have 80% of all your expenses covered in what's really a fixed instrument, you can stay heavily into stocks and make sure you keep your growth because you already got a lot of fixed income instruments. So here's kind of a sample retirement diversification. In my opinion, up to about five years, seven years before retirement, you should be at nearly 100% stocks. Now, if let's say somehow I inherited $27 million, if I've got a huge amount of money, I am not putting it all in stocks. I don't need a lot of growth. All I need to do is preserve that money. For most of us, that's not going to be the case. So here I got a simple uh, portfolio, five years out to retirement. And so we're sitting right here at 500000 This is what our portfolio is. Now we want to shift some of that into bonds. I'm also going to make the assumption that I need to pull about $40,000 a year out of this fund to fund my retirement. I've calculated I want to spend $100,000 a year. My pension and Social Security will cover $60,000. I have a shortfall of $40,000 that I'm going to generate. So in year five, I've got my $500,000. And I'm going to shift here into bonds, $25,000. After I take $25,000 out of stocks and then get an 8% growth in my stock, I'm going to end with $513,000 in stocks the end of that year. Bonds at a 4% rate of return. Now when we do bonds, we could also maybe we're buying five-year CDs, certificates of deposit at banks, so that they're going to mature five years from now. So that'll be my first year of income. So I got $26,000 in that. My total portfolio here is still growing. And then year four, I'm shifting 25000 again. Year three, year two, and year one until I get down here at retirement and I have $551,000 in stocks. So my stock portfolio is still growing. This final year at retirement, I'm not going to shift any more money. After it grows 8%, I got $595,000 and shifting $25,000 each year for five years, including the interest that I'm going to earn, I'm going to have about $130,000 in bonds given me a portfolio at retirement of $726,000. And 
I'm about 20% here, a um, little less, shifted into fixed instruments. When I start to withdraw money, what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull down $25,000 out of stocks, $15,000 out of bonds each year, just as a simple example. And so even though, right, the next year I've got $570,000 in stocks, I pull out some money, but I still got growth. My stock portfolio is still growing. We got a lot of years to go, right, 20, 30 years. We still need growth. You can see here that the bond value went down because we're pulling $15,000 out of bonds and we don't generate enough income to replace that $15,000. And so slowly here, we're going to get weighted more and more towards stocks and less and less towards bonds until we get here three years out. We got $662,000 still in stocks, $92,000 in bonds. We're about $38,000 lower in bonds. <coughs> Excuse me. But our total portfolio is still growing, and that's important. At this point, I might take a big chunk of money and shift it over into bonds to replenish that and keep going the same way that we're going. One limitation I have here, which obviously is huge, is I have kept stocks making 8% every year. I have kept bonds making 4% every year. This is just a simple diversification uh, model. You know, not very complex. We're seeing a shift from stocks into bonds and then a drawdown that has our portfolio still growing. That's where we want to be. In the next video, what to do at retirement, I'm going to uh, get into what is called a sequence of return. Basically, the year you retire is the most dangerous financial day of your entire life. And most of that has to do with sequence of returns. The year I retire is that when we start a depression or a severe recession. And how am I going to react to that? So in the next video, um, what I'm going to talk about and expand upon is what happens if stocks return a negative 32% then a negative 25% and how are we going to handle that? How are we going to readjust? What are the likelihood? What, what are our strategies? What am I exposed to? All right. So we're going to go into those type of variations later, but this simple uh, explanation I think uh, is important to understand before you move on to the more complex one. All right. I appreciate your time. And I hope you have a great day, and hopefully uh, you learned something.